My first question for Professor Hathaway is whether she is aware that in contrast to the Soviets staking a territorial claim by planting their flag at the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, uh, the United States did no such thing on the moon because along with our flag, we left a plaque and the plaque reads as follows. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Stop. What's your question? This ends in a question mark whether she's aware of this. If I may finish the question, I'm still in the beginning of my first sentence. <laughs> okay, these, these, these sentences should not be Proustian. Uh, it, it, ends as, it ends as follows, if I may be permitted, Mr. Chairman. Quote, here men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 1969 AD. We came in peace for all mankind. Close quote, question mark. I agree completely. Um, so I, I was only saying that the Russians cited that as a example. And you're absolutely right that there was no intention in the, I, the, I was not intending to suggest that they were similar in the sense that we were staking a claim and now they're staking a claim. Simply the imagery they were looking for was a similar imagery. Um, and in the Russian instance, that imagery was intended in that case, though not in our case, to stake or at least to suggest the staking of a claim, though when pressed, they said, no, no, that's not at all what we're intending to do. It's simply, simply a kind of uh, uh, a rhetorical move. But it was, it, but so I agree with you. Uh, I, don't, I don't have any disagreement with that point. Jeremy? I, I just want to take this opportunity to say, what, what are we talking about here? Why did we have a flag up there? What that was about was the Law of the Sea Treaty provides a mechanism for arbitrating these disputes. Now, in the history of the world, there have been boundary disputes. And in the history of the world, there's never been the idea that anytime there's a boundary dispute, it has to go to a specified, previously arranged tribunal, which will tell you whether you're right or not in your claim. I don't think we should be letting the Russians take that. On the other hand, I don't think it should be up to some international tribunal to say yes or no, do they have that claim? Let's fight it out with the Russians. Well, let's, and when let's I say hope fight, that's not I literal. Meant, I, when I said fight, I meant argue and then we can have a state-to-state -state treaty. But I, I don't want this settled by third parties. I think okay. you just made my case. No? <laughs> <laughs> if I did make your case, then your case is, your case is we will be constantly at war unless we submit to international authority. And if that's what you're saying, we no longer have sovereignty. Um, my question is for Jeremy Rapkin in light of uh, Professor Hathaway's presentation on the case for international law as if this audience would be opposed to international law. Jeremy, in light of the internationalism of the Federalist Papers, are you saying that you're against international law or you're really just against the form and the mechanisms that have occurred since the Second World War? Uh, of course, the latter. Thank you. I mean, I, I did think that presentation was, you pardon my saying so, demagogic because it, because it implied that uh, if you're against uh, any of the perversions of international law, then you must be for total isolationism and never making an agreement with anyone, which is ridiculous. Our agreement with France won us our independence. Thank you very much. That was great. <laughs> uh, the, the many other excellent treaties. Excellent treaties. I'm not opposed to trade agreements, but I am opposed to setting up some international authority, which then, like a Frankenstein, goes clanking through the world on its own and escapes from our control and tells us what to do. I'm in favor of looking our partners in the eye and saying, for example, to the French, we're really grateful, now it's time for you to take your troops and go home. <laughs> and, and I think it was okay that the French said that to us. I mean, thank you very much, now take your troops and go home. And this was state to state and that's what international understanding should be. It shouldn't be, let's each of us talk to some UN body which will interpret for us what we thought we meant. Okay, briefly. Anna. Just a brief response. I just dispute that that's what's going on in most of the cases that you're attacking. Uh, that, uh, that there's some kind of international body that's going to tell us what to do and it's going to seize uh, the sovereignty the, from us. The, look, the look, Human look, Rights Committee of the UN is telling us what to do. Finish. It absolutely no, is. No, that's not at all true. So it's not at all true. So all the agreements, all the international agreements we're talking about are ones the United States consented to, number one. Number two, the reason that these create any kind of binding obligation within the United States is because of the supremacy clause in the US Constitution that says that treaties are the supreme law of the land. This is why we look to international treaties as a source of law. Right? That's the second point. Third point, there's no instance where the Human Rights Committee is telling us, 
It's a ordering us in some binding way uh, to act in a particular, uh, to do something that we would not choose to do. There is, they have no legal authority. We've not consented to that authority and therefore we're not banned. They can talk. They might disagree with what, they, what we do. They may criticize us, but that's not the same thing as requiring us to act. And so if you pretend that those criticisms, that the Convention Against Torture, that these com the Committee Against Torture, the Human Rights Committee's criticisms constitute binding international law, that's just simply not true. It's simply not true. And so when we pretend that these actually are requiring us to act in a particular uh, way, I just think that's, okay, I'm, that's I'm, false. I'm going to intervene just for the sake of our audience. Thank you. The next question. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Maître Briard um, a question about the English Constitution, but a part that was actually written by two Frenchmen, Monsieur Simon de Montfort and Monsieur Jean de Plantagenet, that is the Magna Carta. In the Magna Carta, there is a provision that has been really at the bottom of the English Constitution that the English people cannot be taxed except by legislation originating in their House of Commons. Is it, what is your understanding under the Lisbon Treaty as to the ongoing validity of that? If the EU wanted to impose a tax on the English, are you saying that the English have already ceded that power under the Lisbon Treaty, or would the English have to go back to their House of Commons in order to um, have a t such a tax be valid? Uh, well, I'm sorry, I'm not a specialist of the Magna Carta, uh, but uh, I know that the British are French because they came from Normandy, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, about tax law, EU law is very clear. Um, tax law is mainly depends on uh, domestic laws, mainly. Uh, but uh, what is interesting, I think, uh, to respond to your question is that EU law may have an influence when it is about uh, the freedom, about freedom for economy, uh, free movement of goods, free movement of uh, a person and capital. And uh, to give you an example, I have a case, a big case, a huge case before Luxembourg now, the Court of Luxembourg. The Court of Luxembourg is going to uh, interpret EU law, just say what EU law means regarding the freedom, uh, free movement of capital. And then our Supreme Court will decide. I think uh, for uh, the UK, it's almost the same. So I would say it's mainly national, domestic, unless it compromises uh, EU principles. 